coming to you now is Bread of His Presence with your host, Pastor Cameron Urey, Senior Pastor and Bible Teacher at Renton Park Chapel in Renton, Washington. Well, greetings and welcome again to Bread of His Presence. We've begun a new series together on the life of Joseph. And like we saw last week, Joseph was born amid some very unusual, and I would even say painful, circumstances. His father had four different wives. Now, that's not at all unusual nowadays. I'm sure you also have known people who have had a whole sequence of spouses. The only problem here is that they were not all in sequence. No, Jacob had all his wives at the same time. (laughs) And, uh, oh my goodness, what a mess. Jacob had only wanted one wife, Rachel through whom was born Joseph and Benjamin. But on the night that he thought he was marrying her, her father Laban instead slipped her sister Leah into the wedding chamber. And when Jacob woke up the next morning, he discovered that the woman he had taken to be his wife was not the woman he had worked the past seven years for. And so horrified, he confronts Laban, who says, you know, it's not customary to marry the younger daughter off first. I will give you, Rachel, but you must work for me yet another seven years. And Jacob, I mean, he just wants the woman he fell in love with and had already worked for. But he agrees. And so he ends up with two wives. Now, the sad part about this is that Leah was not loved by Jacob. And we can hardly fault him for that because he had never loved her. And what's so sad is that because of her father Laban, Leah would never find someone who would love her in that way. She would never have a true soulmate or be the apple of any man's eye. Laban, a narcissist to the core, had used her, had destroyed her life in order to squeeze just a few more years out of Jacob. And what's so heartbreaking is to see how much Leah, wanting that love, tries to win it from Jacob by trying to bear children for him. And so this fierce competition arises between the sisters for Jacob's love. They compete with one another in producing children because, in their minds, the one who can outproduce the other will be most loved. And when they stop producing, they give Jacob their maidservants, Bilhah and Zilpah, as wives to bear children through. And so more children are born through these maidservants, and eventually, tragically, Rachel dies in childbirth, giving birth to Benjamin. And so Jacob is left with the three wives that he never truly loved and loses the one woman he had loved with all his heart. And all he has left of her memory are the two sons that she bore to him, Joseph and Benjamin. Now, what ends up happening is that this broken situation produces an atmosphere of differentiation between the different sons. Jacob doesn't love all his sons equally because he didn't love all his wives equally. Now, should he have tried to love his sons equally, despite whose mothers they were born of? Of course, yes, he should have. But we also have to recognize just how broken his situation was. You know, I'm amazed at the times that I have heard people try to use the Bible to justify polygamy. I feel that the Bible is perhaps the greatest treatise against it. Where in the Bible is there any polygamous relationship presented that is not permeated with heartbreak and dissension? You can't find it. And this story is no exception. Now, what made matters worse, and yes, it gets a lot worse, is that Jacob had Joseph report on his other brothers, who were far less moral than he was. 
It says in Genesis 37, verses 1 through 2, Jacob lived in the land where his father had stayed, the land of Canaan. These are the family records of Jacob. At 17 years of age, Joseph tended sheep with his brothers. The young man was working with the sons of Bilhah and Zilpah, his father's wives, and he brought a bad report about them to their father. Now, we don't know exactly what the sons of Bilhah and Zilpah were doing that caused Joseph to feel compelled to bring a bad report to their father, but whatever it was, Joseph clearly felt that his father needed to know about it. And seeing from the rest of the story how much wisdom and discernment Joseph had, he likely wouldn't have given this negative report about them unless what they were doing was extremely wicked. Maybe Jacob asked Joseph directly what these sons were doing, and Joseph, not wanting to lie, told him. And Jacob then likely talked to his sons, who obviously knew who the informer was, and therefore hated Joseph for being that informer. But you know, their hatred also stemmed from something else. Not only was Joseph the child of the favored wife, not only was he a righteous person who, both simply by his righteousness but also by his negative reports, revealed their unrighteousness, but he was also the favored son. Look at what it says in verse 3. Now Israel loved Joseph more than his other sons. Because Joseph was a son born to him in his old age, and he made a long-sleeved robe for him. Now, some of your translations might say something akin to a coat of many colors, but honestly, we don't know that for sure. The Septuagint favored that translation of the Hebrew phrase that was used by Moses, but some prefer a long-sleeved robe or an ornamented tunic. But we can't really be sure what this famous coat of many colors looked like, although richly ornamented robe is probably the best translation. Now, apart from verses 23 and 32, the only other place the Hebrew word is found that describes this richly ornamented robe is in the Old Testament in 2 Samuel chapter 13, verse 18, and it's used to describe the garment of a king's daughter. But what set Joseph's coat apart was that it had long sleeves and it reached all the way down to his ankles. It was the rich garment of a ruler and not what the well-dressed shepherd needed out in the fields. However, Jacob had something more important than just fashion in mind when he gave Joseph this very special coat. It was more than just a sign of special treatment. No, it marked something much more serious. And that was that the coat or robe that Jacob gave Joseph was probably his way of letting the family know that Joseph had been chosen to be his heir. Reuben had forfeited his firstborn status because of his sin with Bilhah, which we talked about last week. And his next son, Simeon, had been involved with Levi in slaughtering the men of Shechem. Remember, their sister Dinah had been raped by a man from that village. And they had taken vengeance by really wiping out that entire village, which really kind of put Jacob and his family in danger because it made them a stench to the surrounding Canaanite peoples. Furthermore, Jacob's first four sons had Leah as their mother, and Jacob hadn't intended on marrying Leah. The full intent of his heart was to marry Rachel, but Laban had tricked him. And so in light of all that, Jacob might have reasoned, you know, in God's sight, Rachel was my first wife and Joseph was her firstborn. Therefore, Joseph has the right to be treated as the firstborn. 
And so the robe, it marked the owner as the one whom the father intended to be the future leader of the household, an honor normally given to the firstborn son. We actually see another thing in the text that seems to indicate this, because at the very end of the story, we'll see that when Jacob is old, he gives Joseph the inheritance of a firstborn son, a double portion of his estate. And the way he does this is by adopting Joseph's two sons, Ephraim and Manasseh, as his own. Because in doing that, they would become two of the tribes of Israel instead of just one. And so we can begin to understand why the brothers hated Joseph so deeply. To the point where it says in verse 4 and following, When his brothers saw that their father loved him more than all his brothers, they hated him and could not bring themselves to speak peaceably to him. Now, their hatred is also compounded by yet another element added into the mix, and that is the fact that Joseph was also a dreamer. It says in verse 5 and following, Then Joseph had a dream. When he told it to his brothers, they hated him even more. He said to them, Listen to this dream I had. There we were, binding sheaves of grain in the field. Suddenly, my sheaf stood up, and your sheaves gathered around it and bowed down to my sheaf. Are you really going to reign over us? His brothers asked him. Are you really going to rule us? So they hated him even more because of his dream and what he had said. Then he had another dream and told it to his brothers. Look, he said, I had another dream. And this time, the sun, moon, and eleven stars were bowing down to me. He told his father and brothers, and his father rebuked him. What kind of dream is this that you have had, he said? Am I and your mother and your brothers really going to come and bow down to the ground before you? His brothers were jealous of him, but his father kept the matter in mind. Now, was Joseph being arrogant? Was he being egocentric in sharing these dreams? Uh, I don't know. Some people say so. And yet, elsewhere in the story, he seems to be remarkably humble. You know, one of the things that may help to shed light on this is the fact that while, yes, as one commentator put it, some think Joseph had been spoiled to the point where he was completely insensitive to how his words would affect others, others point out that in that day, when a person had a clear vision from God, he was expected to share it with other people, no matter how it, it might impact his own life. Joseph had told Pharaoh later, when he had two dreams, with the same message, that the matter had been firmly decided by God, and God would do it soon. And if Joseph believed that his own two dreams were going to happen soon, he probably felt obligated to tell his family. And so he does. But as we'll see next week, the brothers will capture him, and eventually sell him into slavery, partially to make sure that those dreams never come about. And yet, as we'll see, it is in the very process of their trying to make the fulfillment of Joseph's dreams impossible that they actually set them into motion. Joseph would be mistreated. He would be sold as a slave. He would be carried away. He would suffer all manner of wrongdoings. And yet, though he suffered, God would eventually use that suffering as a means of salvation for many people. And those promises revealed to Joseph in his dreams would eventually become a reality. But not only would he rule, but there would be a restoration of relationship unlike anything else we see in Scripture before Jesus Christ. And it is a picture of what God can do in each and every one of our lives. He will give us justice eventually. He will lift us up. 
and he can bring together even the most broken of families. But we may have to go through a dark time, just as Joseph did. And yet we do so with a Bible in our hands, which contains promises from God for us. One of my favorites is Jeremiah 29, 11, which says, For I know the plans I have for you. This is the Lord's declaration, plans for your well-being, not for disaster, to give you a future and a hope. Let's lean on that promise this day and every day. Amen and amen. Today's episode of Bread of His Presence is brought to you by Renton Park Chapel, a church that is committed to the ministry of sharing the joy of hearing and doing God's Word and to the mission of bringing people into the life-giving presence of Jesus Christ in and through vibrant preaching, teaching, Bible study, prayer, and ministry to a world that is in desperate need of the healing touch of Jesus Christ. If you'd like to learn more about our ministry here at Renton Park Chapel or would like to subscribe to the Bread of His Presence podcast, you can visit us online at rentonparkchapel.org or breadofhispresence.org. You can also find us on Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, and Instagram. We look forward to hearing from you. Thank you for listening. And may you know all the fullness of having in your life the bread of the presence of God.